Um, it's really my pleasure today to uh, welcome you all to uh, the Joint Academic Ophthalmology Activity on Riyadh. Dr. Abdurrahman, he chose to talk about epidemic uh, uh, disease, diabetic uh, uh, disease, and the clinical trial in managing diabetic retinopathy. And I would like to welcome Dr. Abdurrahman Zaid, and the stage is yours. Assalamu uh, alaikum, I'm Abdurrahman Zaid, and thank you, Dr. Abdullah, for the introduction. Uh, our grand round, uh, grand round today is uh, about diabetic retinopathy clinical trial update. Uh, so why did I choose this topic? Diabetes, because diabetes is a significant health burden in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. By 2020, the prevalence of diabetes have been estimated by some study to reach up to 47%. And the rate of diabetic retinopathy is high, reaching between 19 to 36, as reported in different parts of Saudi. So we, when we want to see the a clinical trial for diabetic retinopathy, there is uh, no better than the diabetic retinopathy uh, uh, clinical research network or the DRCR. And they have started the publication from back to, in 2003 uh, up to this year. And they have a lot of coming st uh, study and they are not done yet in the field of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, so I'll be talking about my talk about, we can divide it into uh, three main parts. Uh, what the, the, the DRCR network have shown us previously. Uh, uh, this is the first part. The second part will be about the recent pub, uh, published report by the DRCR network. And the last part is what's coming in the future. Uh, so what are the major advances in the treatment of the diabetic macular edema? In 2008, we have the protocol B. Uh, which have studied steroid for diabetic macular edema and compared it uh, uh, versus laser. So prior to that, the first potential benefit of intravitreal time is known was reported in 2001. And in 2002, in a survey by a retina specialist, 52% of them was using intravitreal time is known. But was it superior to laser or not? This was not known at that time. So we have the protocol B when they studied uh, four milligram of trimestrone versus one milligram versus laser. Uh, and actually, in the beginning, in the first four months of the study, uh, the trimestrone group, were, uh, especially the four milligram group, uh, were superior in visual acuity. Uh, but this diminished uh, markedly. And by the 16 uh, month, laser was superior compared to them and remained superior throughout the study. Um, and, and, and this caused a dramatic subsequent decrease in the use of trimestrone for diabetic macular edema uh, and confirmed that laser was superior in diabetic macular edema in the long run compared to trimestrone. Uh, and uh, as we uh, see, the increase in 10 liter uh, was higher in the trimestrone group, especially the four milligram by the eight month, which also tend to decrease in both of the trimestrone arm, uh, while in the laser arm, the increase in letter uh, were increasing. And by the 24 month, there was a marked increase in the increase in letter in the laser arm compared to the translon. Uh, and when you look to the loss of 10 letter or more, uh, initially the translon were better. And by the 12 month, uh, this shifted and laser were better in, in, in the fact that it has uh, uh, minimal loss of 10 letter or more. And we can see that the laser arm have been stable throughout the study from starting from four, uh, the, the, uh, the, the first four months till the end of the study at, at 24 months. Uh, and this shift is, uh, is related to the cataract formation as, uh, as, what we, uh, as what's shown in that study. When you look to the central subfield uh, thickness, uh, similar to the vision initially, the four milligram trimestrone was markedly better and it uh, and had the, the least central uh, uh, subfield thickness in, uh, in, in micron. Uh, but later on, uh, the laser catch up, and at the end of the study, the laser arm was better. Uh, and, we, and similarly, when we look to the group that lost more than 250 micron, the first four months showed dramatic decrease in the four milligram of trimestrone. But this shift at the end of the study and the laser on catch up and 
they meant better than the tramecillon. And when, when we look to the cumulative probability of cataract surgery for over three years, uh, it was clinically significantly much higher in the tramecillon four milligram group compared to the one milligram group. And of course, compared uh, to the laser group. Uh, and, and this huge cumulative probability of cataract surgery can explain why, uh, why the vision improvement and, uh, and why uh, the trimestrial arm is not better than laser because the higher risk of cataract surgery. But in fact, even uh, after uh, uh, undergoing cataract surgery, if you compare the huge difference, the laser arm will still have better central subfield thickness and central uh, and vision. So the conclusion was focal grid is more effective than trimestrial with fewer side effect at two years. And that laser uh, and uh, both laser and trimestrial uh, improve visual acuity uh, compared to no treatment courses. Uh, most I treated with the four milligram trimestrial required cataract surgery, and there was no lo long term benefit uh, for trimestrial DME compared to the laser group. And then in 2010, we have protocol I, uh, which assists the anti VGF for diabetic MAC edema. Uh, Prior to, to that, VGF was identified in 1994, and anti-VGF approved for new vascular MD, but not in DME. And macular laser was not effect, uh, efficacious for all eye with DME, uh, and there was a clear unmet need for a novel therapy. Uh, and what happened after the study? Uh, this led to a new standard of care for diabetic macular edema with vision uh, loss. Uh, so they compared four arms, Sham with uh, laser, ranibizumab plus pump laser versus ranibizumab and deferred laser and uh, tramisilone with laser. Uh, and, what, uh, and they assessed first in the 24 months, then they, they extended the study. And what's shown in that study was the superiority for, the, for both ranibizumab group compared to tramisilone and compared to laser. Um, but when we look into the sedificic patient, uh, uh, that the trimestrial plus laser uh, plus uh, laser group were comparable to the ranibizumab plus prompt laser group, but still less than the ranibizumab and the deferred laser group. Uh, and when they looked to the cumulative probability of cataract surgery for over the two years, it was similar to protocol B with markedly higher incidence of cataract formation when we when we uh, uh, when the patient undergo treatment with trimestrial. Uh, 74% in the trimestrial group compared to 18 and 16 in the ranibizumab group. Uh, in 2011, we have uh, protocol J which assists the short-term effect of ranibizumab or trimestrial on diabetic maca edema following BRP. And they concluded that the addition of one intravitreal tamislon or two ranibizumab injection in eye receiving uh, focal uh, or grid laser for diabetic macular edema and BRB is associated with better visual acuity and decreased macular edema by 14 weeks. We, uh, so this study assists the first 14 weeks. And whether continued long-term intravitreal treatment is beneficial cannot be determined from that study. Uh, so by 14 weeks, there was marked improvement in, uh, in, in vision, and we can see that from the uh, visual acuity letter score reaching uh, uh, 3 and 2 per, uh, in 14 weeks compared to the loss uh, of uh, 4 uh, in the group that received CHAM plus laser. Uh, but if you look to the extension of the study, we can notice that the ranibizumab group by 56 weeks still remained much higher than the sham, but uh, the trimestrial group, this effect uh, decreased with time, and this most uh, related again to cataract formation in the trimestrial group. So in 2015, uh, we have protocol S, which assists the anti-VGF for Prefer, uh, for perforative diabetic retinopathy. It assists intravenous anti-VGF. Uh, previously, we know that anti-VGF regress retinal vascularization, but long-term visual anatomic outcome were unknown in eyes with perforative diabetic retinopathy. And uh, we needed to look for a therapeutic alternative for BRP, which is effective but destructive. Uh, 
And by the end of that study, uh, we noticed that the, uh, the, uh, the visual acuity gain was similar in both uh, ranibizumab and the BRP group, and that the uh, ranibizumab was none inferior to the uh, when compared to the BRP. Uh, uh, and the valuable information provided in long-term visual acuity, peripheral visual field treatment burden, and safety outcome in the eye. Uh, so when we look uh, in the main change in visual acuity, uh, we can notice that uh, there is a gain of uh, plus 2.8 uh, letter in the uh, ranibizumab group compared to a loss of uh, uh, 0.2. Uh, uh, and we look to, to the main change uh, in visual acuity stratified with the presence of baseline DME. In the group that had the baseline DME, we can notice a marked improvement uh, even more than the collective group with plus 7.9 letter compared to plus two. Uh, whereas in the group without, base, uh, without baseline DME, uh, still the ranibizumab group had higher in gain of letter, but it was not clinically significant. Uh, when you look to the center of subfield thickness changes over the two years between the ranibizumab group and BRP, uh, collectively, uh, ranibizumab group had uh, loss of around 47 micron compared to my, uh, three micron only in the uh, BRP group. Uh, and uh, this loss was even more in the patient and patient group with DME uh, with loss of minus 153 micron uh, compared to 48. And in the, uh, in, the, in the group without baseline DME, uh, there was a loss of 18 micron only in the ranibizumab group compared to a gain of plus 10 uh, in the BRP group, and this was clinically significant. Uh, and when we look to the properties of eye to develop uh, diabetic edema with vision impairment, uh, the percentage of patients that developed uh, diabetic edema in the BRP group were 28 compared to 9, uh, and, and this was clinically significant. Uh, and this makes sense since the patient uh, were receiving anti-VGF in the ranibizumab group. Uh, when we look to the complication of PDR, uh, ranibizumab group had lower complication risk in all category, uh, but they were non -clin not clinically significant except in the rate of vitrectomy. It was clinically significant, where 4% of the patients in the ranibizumab group underwent vitrectomy compared to 15. Uh, and when we look to other ocular adverse uh, events, they were similar. Uh, the risk of endophthalmitis was 0.5% uh, in the ranibizumab group compared to no endophthalmitis in the PRP. Uh, uh, and of course, we, we all know that uh, due to the giving of intraocular injection, there is a risk of endophthalmitis in the ranibizumab group. Uh, but because the, uh, that, uh, the incidence of endothermitis was extremely low, uh, uh, B-value cannot be calculated for clinical significance. So the conclusion of that study that BRP was effective for uh, uh, BDR over the last four decades, and it's remained effective in the 21st century. Uh, Ranibizumab for BDR is at least as good uh, uh, as and it's not inferior to BRP uh, when we compare the visual acuity at five years. Uh, ranibizumab is an effective treatment alternative for BRP, uh, for BRP in cases of BDR, and there was no, no substantial safety concern for at least five years. Uh, and maybe it is the preferred initial treatment approach for some patients, uh, meaning the patient with uh, with perforative diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema. Uh, but we uh, need to make sure that the study, uh, the patient have a strict follow-up in order to achieve those outcomes. And this is not true when we compare them to our patients with uh, a large percentage of patients missing follow-up even for longer time, where BRP can play a better role uh, because it's a treatment for a long run and it can stabilize uh, the, uh, the disparmently without the need for frequent re-injection. And this was shown later on in a, a, a later study, uh, which studied the eye uh, who lost follow-up and showed that, uh, a devastating complication in eyes who lost follow-up in the ranibizumab who were treated with ranibizumab compared to this.
So uh, also in 2015, we have protocol T, uh, which compared the effectiveness of different anti-VGF agents for diabetic macroedema. Uh, prior to that, there was no clear uh, mandate for anti-VGF as first-line therapy for diabetic macroedema, uh, but major difference in cost do exist and also the avail avail availability between different anti-VGF agents. And uh, public health importance uh, is to, to understand potential difference in efficacy between medication. Uh, so the study assists uh, uh, three agents, uh, patient for randomized to receiving uh, aflipercept versus bifazizumab and uh, ranipizumab, uh, and then were studied. Uh, patient, uh, all three agents were highly, effect uh, highly effective. All three agents have similar effect in vision for eyes with, uh, with starting aptitude of 20, uh, 32 to 2040. Uh, and aflatoxib is considered by many in, uh, as the initial treatment for eye with 20, uh, 50 vision or worse. Uh, and this is shown in the graph uh, next to us. We can see the uh, gain of litter uh, was clinically significant uh, in the aflatoxib group when compared to patients who uh, had initial vision of 20, 50 or worse. And that the vision uh, for patients who had better than 2050 vision uh, were similar between all the group with uh, a gain of around plus eight liter in, uh, in those patients. Uh, when you look to the main change in visual acne letter for the full cohort, uh, we can see a gain of 13 in the aflipercept group uh, compared to 11 and 10 in the ranibizumab and bifacizumab group respectively. Uh, and this was clinically significant at 52 weeks. When we look to the main uh, change in visual acuity uh, for the patient who had better than 2050 vision, we can see that they had uh, uh, basically similar with around plus eight and uh, all of those uh, three groups. Uh, but when we look when the vision was 2050 or worse, uh, we can see a uh, marked gain of vision and aflipercept, which was clinically significantly better than uh, both uh, ranibizumab and, uh, 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 and bifacizumab. When we look to the overall change in uh, uh, OCT uh, thickness over time, uh, uh, aflipercept had the uh, uh, a better result with minus 160 micron compared to 147 and 101 uh, in the uh, uh, group. And the difference between the aflipercept and bifacizumab was clinically significant, as well as the difference between ranibizumab and bifacizumab. Uh, when we look to the main uh, change in OCT in patients who have better vision than 2050, we can see that they have. Uh, 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 almost similar decrease in thickness between uh, aflipercept and ranibizumab, uh, but the bifacizumab uh, arm uh, at the ranibizumab. And also ranibizumab was clinically significantly lower than the bifacizumab group as well. Uh, so uh, from the previous slide, we can notice a trend that when the patient had 2050 or worse vision, uh, the uh, benefit of uh, aflipercept was uh, clearer compared to the other two agents. And when the vision was better than 2050, uh, the graphs were almost similar. So the conclusion of, the, of that uh, uh, of protocol T that all three agents uh, are effective in treating diabetic macroedema causing vision impairment. And that when the initial visual acuity uh, loss is mild, uh, there is little difference between them. And when we have a worse visual acuity to begin with, aflipercept was more effective in improving vision. So uh, after that, we have uh, protocol U in 2018, which assists dexamethasone plus ranibizumab versus ranibizumab alone for eye with persistent diabetic macroedema and visual acuity impairment despite previous anti-VGF treatment. Um, and uh, by six months, uh, the main visual acuity improvement was not better in the dexamethasone uh, ranibizumab group compared to the sham ranibizumab group. Uh, 
uh, but, but there was a greater reduction in retinal thickness in the, in the combination group, meaning dexamethasone methazone and ranibizumab. And the study was not su uh, sufficiently uh, sized to determine whether treatment response might differ uh, by lens status when we look into the cytophilic patient. Uh, so here, when we look to the uh, visual activity uh, mean change, it was similar in both group by the 24 week. Uh, with actually the ranibizumab uh, solo group having slightly higher vision, but it was not clinically significant. Uh, uh, but when we looked uh, to, uh, to, to assess uh, according to the baseline lens status, we uh, in the left, when we look to the certificate group, we can see that both of them were similar uh, throughout the study, but at the end, the combination group were, uh, uh, gained much uh, later, plus five compared to plus two, whereas in the FICIC group, uh, the difference was, uh, th there was no market difference between, uh, between them. Uh, but again, due to the few number uh, of patients in that study, we could not assess uh, the, uh, if, the, if this changes were clinically significant or not. When you look to the OCT's uh, uh, central support thickness uh, change, we can notice that the, running, uh, the combination group achieved uh, uh, lower thickness with loss of uh, minus uh, uh, 110 micron compared to 62 uh, in the ranibizumab alone group. And this was clinically significant. Uh, so uh, combination may reduce the thickness more, but it did not change the visual acuity. Uh, so uh, in 2019, uh, after that, we got protocol B, which assessed anti-VGF versus laser versus observation for eyes with diabetic macular edema and good vision. Uh, so basically, uh, it was a randomized multicenter clinical trial uh, that assessed the patient who had 20, 25 vision or better. Uh, with minimal or no prior treatment for diabetic macular edema. Uh, and uh, uh, they enrolled them into three groups, either uh, the, the use of anti-VGF in the form of aflipercept or the use of laser with deferred anti-VGF needed. Uh, and the third group was observation plus deferring anti-VGF as well when needed. Uh, and when did they use rescue aflipercept in the laser and observation group? It is when at single visit, a patient lose uh, two line of visual acuity or he lose uh, one line at two consecutive uh, visits. And because they were assessing diabetic macroedema and good vision, they did not rely into the, thick, uh, in the thickness of the, of, the, uh, of the macula to determine the need of uh, injection. So even if the uh, center subfield thickness uh, increased, they did not inject the patient and, and they relied only on observing the vision of the patient. And the, uh, and the primary outcome was the proportion of eye losing more than five liters in visual acuity at two years. Uh, so uh, the, the percentage of patients who uh, regained 22 or better vision at uh, two years uh, was 77% of the population in the, uh, of the eyes in the aflipercept group compared to 71 in the laser group and 66 uh, per, uh, percentage of the eyes regaining 2020 vision in the observation group. And the change between aflipercept and observation was clinically significant uh, when we compare 77 and 66, uh, but, not, uh, but it was not clinically significant when compared to the laser group. The mean visual acuity uh, uh, at two years uh, all three group uh, had similar mean visual acuity of 2020 at the end uh, of the two years of the study with no, uh, with no difference between any of the group. Uh, and when we look to the uh, mean visual acuity letter score changing from uh, the beginning of the study uh, till the first year, uh, a flip percept was better compared to both groups, and this was clinically significant. And we can see here in the middle of the graph, plus, uh, the gain of uh, uh, plus 2.1 compared to uh, 0 0.1. Uh, but this was not the same at the end of the study, uh, when this gain was still there, but 
due to the mild drop, it was not clinically significant with the plus 0.9 compared to plus uh, 0.1 compared to uh, minus of uh, 0.4 in the observation group. So the initial gain of uh, uh, that was in the African percent group was not observed at the end of the two years. And we look to the main change in OCP, uh, center of thickness for baseline. Uh, again, uh, in the first year, there was marked decrease in the center of thickness uh, with minus 50 uh, uh, micron in the after percept group compared to minus 30 uh, in the laser and minus 25 in the observation group. Uh, and this change was clinically significant. But at the end of the study, this uh, the both the laser group and the observation group catch on, cashed on, and uh, the loss of uh, uh, of the center sphere thickness was similar in both uh, three group. Uh, yes, aflibercept had uh, the best loss in the center sphere thickness, uh, but the other two group were, were catching on, and and the change was not clinically significant. Uh, from that, we noticed that. Uh, from those, the last four slides that uh, the vision and the center of thickness were better in the aflibercept group at the end of the first year, uh, but did not continue so by the end of the second year, and both three groups were similar. Uh, th and then they compared the, uh, when they needed injection uh, in the laser and observation group. Uh, and, they, uh, and we can notice that the need of injection was higher in the laser group compared to the observation group, with 13% of patients in the, um, in the laser group requiring injection by the end of the first uh, year compared to 28th, and this was clinically significant. Uh, and by, by the end of the second year, it was 26 compared to, to 36. So uh, what we can conclude from protocol B uh, that there was no difference in rate of uh, one or more line of visual loss at the end of the two years among all the patients, and that all three management strategy resulted in a mean visual equity of 2020. Uh, uh, and that the proportion of eye of 2020 or better was significantly greater in the aptly percept 77 compared to 66 in the observation group. Uh, and the proportion of eyes 2025 20, or better were similar in all of the group reaching 85%. And that the majority of eye in the laser group uh, and also the observation group did not receive a flibercept during the study. So among eyes with central involved diabetic macadema with good vision, uh, uh, <coughs> Given the cost risk and the risk of associated uh, uh, endophthalmitis with injection, uh, unless VA worsen, a patient can be observed. Uh, and that the participants with greater OCT centers of peer thickness and greater severity of uh, uh, retinopathy, uh, and the patient who were receiving uh, diabetic macadema treatment in the non studied eye were more likely to require the percept. Uh, and actually, uh, we can make uh, a claim that uh, each of the uh, we can claim that each of the we can claim that each of the uh, study protocol may be the best uh, management. For example, uh, the highest percentage of patients receiving 2020 was the percent group, and this was clinically significant. Uh, and when we talk about laser, the patient who received laser uh, did not require uh, as frequent injection as observation. Uh, so yes, I agree that observation is the best course of action, uh, but anyone can claim any of, the, uh, of these treatment modalities could work for his patient. So what are the, this is what uh, the research have shown us in the past. So what are the recently completed protocol in the DRCR network? Uh, we have first of all protocol A, which assists the peripheral diabetic retinopathy lesion on ultra wide field fundus imaging and the risk of diabetic retinopathy worsening over time. Uh, so the primary uh, objective is to assess uh, the uh, images in the ultra uh, wide field images compared to the uh, 
80 DRS uh, uh, seven standard field images uh, and to assess whether they're similar uh, or not. And uh, uh, does uh, predominantly peripheral lesion affect the, uh, the, uh, our analysis of those photos? Uh, uh, so when they compared uh, both the uh, ETDRS photo and the ultrawide field masked uh, photo, 84% uh, uh, of the patient had no difference or a difference by one step. Uh, uh, and in uh, 8%, the ATDRS grading was, wor uh, was worse by more than two steps. And in 7%, the ultra wide field uh, mass grading were higher uh, by more than two steps. But they needed to do an ad uh, adjudication for the patient who have more than two uh, 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 line of difference, plus for the patient who the images were not taking similarly in the ATDRS group and the ultrawide, meaning that the cut rate of the ultrawide feed imaging did not match the ATDRS because we do not know was there something in the image that may uh, alter the uh, attribution of the different examiner. Uh, and then they looked for uh, uh, both the grading uh, uh, after the adjudication. The adjudication is they assigned a senior uh, retina specialist to look for the uh, dif uh, difference in those photos. And by the end, 96% were similar uh, or within one step difference. And 1% uh, per uh, of the patient, the ATDRS grading was worse. And 2% the ultra wide feed uh, mass grading was worse. Uh, so they looked to the eye with predominantly peripheral legion, uh, and, uh, and they looked uh, to the difference. Uh, when the eyes without uh, predominantly peripheral legion, which includes 59% uh, of the study, uh, there was no difference in grade in 96%. But when the eye had predominantly peripheral legion, uh, which included 40% of the study population, uh, the grading was not different in only 72%. And 27% of those who did not have equal grading had uh, uh, an ultra wide feed uh, periphery grade worse. Uh, so the conclusion of that study that uh, there is a moderate to substantial agreement between ETRS uh, photo and ultra wide images and ultra wide feed images uh, massed to them. Uh, and after education, diabetic retinopathy severity by the ETDRS photo unmasked. Uh, ultra wide field images matched exactly in uh, 59% and are within one step in 96%. And that uh, peripheral lesion exists in 40% of the eyes, implying potentially worse severity of diabetic retinopathy in 8% when we compare the EDTRS and the ultra wide field image. Then we have the uh, result published in 2020 uh, in protocol AB, which assessed the intra, uh, vitreous uh, uh, anti VGF versus vitrectomy for uh, vitreous hemorrhage from uh, four uh, cases uh, from cases of uh, VDR. And before talking about this study, I will talk briefly about uh, protocol N, which was published in 2013. In protocol N, they compared the injection between uh, uh, injection of ranibizumab and sham to assess the need of vitrectomy later on in cases of vitreous hemorrhage from BDR. Uh, and uh, uh, at the end, 14% in the ranibizumab and 17% and in the sham uh, study required vitrectomy. And this was not clinically significant, indicating that uh, anti-VGF uh, was not effective in diminishing the need of anti-VGF uh, in cases of, uh, not diminishing the need of vitrectomy in cases of vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, so it, it's listened the value of anti-VGF to give it to, uh, uh, in cases of vitreous hemorrhage in order to try to decrease the vitrectomy need. So what was the aim of this study? It was to compare the visual equity outcome uh, between two uh, groups the group that received initial vitrectomy plus PRP, uh, and later on uh, when needed given uh, a plebercept for diabetic macroedema if required, 
And another arm of patients who have uh, uh, where to treat them with anti-VGF. And if vitreous image did not clear, then we do vitrectomy for them. So they were randomized to vitrectomy plus BRB versus anti-VGF. And at the end, we assess the visual acuity. And we can see that uh, uh, by the first four weeks, there was marked improvement in the vitrectomy plus BRB compared to the aflibercept, which was clinically significant. Uh, but after 24 weeks, which is the study uh, target, they were both the same. And we extend the follow-up, uh, both group matched without uh, difference in the final visual acuity. Uh, so visual acuity uh, in the first four weeks it was clinically significantly better in the vitrectomy plus PRB group, 49 compared to 25%. Uh, with the patient who ha uh, have uh, greater vision and also in the patient who have poorer vision in the study. But at 24 weeks, both pa uh, patient uh, had uh, uh, similar vision with 63% uh, and 60% uh, uh, in the aflipercept group and 60% in the vitrectomy group reaching 2030 or better vision. Uh, and uh, similarly patient with uh, lower vision with 10% in both group reaching low vision at 24 weeks. Uh, at two years, the results were similar uh, to uh, uh, 24 uh, four weeks with no marked difference between, the, uh, the, between initial vitrectomy or uh, aflipercept injection. Uh, so in summary, uh, in eyes with vitreous hemorrhage from peripheral diabet uh, diabetic retinopathy, there was no significant difference in mean visual acuity score over 24 weeks, and even after we extend that for two years. And that one in three eyes assigned to the aflibercept group underwent vitrectomy to clear the vitreous hemorrhage. One in three eyes assigned to the vitrectomy group uh, were initiated with aflibercept treatment for diabetic macular edema. Uh, and yes, uh, vision improved uh, more quickly with vitrectomy, but long-term vision was uh, similar between both groups. Uh, and that the vision were actually uh, better in just between the first four and, uh, and 12 weeks. And after, one, after that, it remained uh, the same throughout the study. So uh, are the DRCR network done or, uh, or there are coming studies. When we look to the future, uh, diabetic retinopathy remain a leading cause of vision loss worldwide, and that 50% of eye with DMEE do not respond fully to anti-VGF, and that uh, we don't, yet we don't understand diabetic retinopathy mechanism lim limit and therapeutic advances, and there are no methods to prevent diabetic retinopathy onset or early worsening, and uh, Patient uh, lose uh, vision due to treatment cost, access, and availability issue. Uh, and there are limited resources to deal with expanding global burden of diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. And there is a gap between the clinical trial result and the real world outcome. So uh, how to treat, uh, tackle those issues? We can optimize treatment for diabetic retinopathy. Uh, and there is a, a coming study, we'll talk about it, protocol AE. Uh, we can improve the understanding and mechanism of underlying diabetic retinopathy, doing genetic and uh, biobanking of the sample. Uh, we can find effective strategy as in upcoming uh, studies in protocol W and protocol A uh, AF. And uh, we can tackle the cost by protocol AC, which I'll talk briefly now about. Uh, and we can develop efficient method for diabetic retinopathy screening, like protocol AA, what we, we just mentioned, and in artificial intelligence. So our aim is to preserve vision for uh, all patients with diabetes. So what are the upcoming and ongoing study by the DRCR network? We have protocol W, which have assisted intra uh, vitreous anti vgf treatment for the, for the prevention of vision threatening diabetic retinopathy in eye at high risk. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll be going about the upcoming study uh, in a very brief manner. So the aim of the protocol uh, W is to assist to anti vgf uh, decrease the, uh, the, the progression of uh, uh, from severe numbers to diabetic retinopathy to VDR. Uh, uh, and uh, in cases of uh, severe MBDR with no 
uh, clinical uh, with no center involving diabetic macular edema. So they will assign the patient to two arm observation versus uh, anti-VGF. And the primary outcome is to assess the proportion of eye that develop BDR or BDR related outcome. And also the percentage of patients who develop centrally involved diabetic macular edema. So the rationale uh, that the application of, uh, of earlier anti-VGF therapy in the course of the disease could help reduce the future potential treatment burden in patients with diabetes. And that if the study demonstrated that anti-VGF treatment is effective and safe in the setting of severe BDR, a new strategy to prevent vision threatening complication will be available for the patient. We have protocol AC, uh, which tackled the costiveness of the anti-VGF. Uh, what we learned from protocol uh, T, that in patients with better vision, uh, different anti-VGF were the same. But in patients who have uh, 2050 or worse vision, aflipercept uh, show better results compared to the other two. So the aim of this study is, uh, is a randomization trial uh, into two arms, intravitreous aflipercept versus intravitreous bifizizumab plus deferred aflipercept for treatment of centrally involved diabetic macadema but they are sending the patient who have the worst baseline visual acuity. Why? Because we already know that if the patient have a better vision for protocol T, that the, uh, all anti-VGF agents are the, uh, the same. And the aim of the uh, study is to tackle the cost issue in order to minimize the cost when treating patients with diabetic macular edema. Um, so, uh, the, uh, the enrollment for, for this uh, trial uh, is for patients who only have 2050 or worse vision uh, because bifizumab is, uh, as shown in protocol T, is well effective when the vision is better. And the randomization is to offer percept alone versus uh, the first group and the other group for bifizumab plus after percept if needed. And the aim of study is that if both two uh, arms showed similar outcome, uh, then uh, there will be a huge cutting cost when we start the patient with bifizumab and then shift them to aflipercept only when needed. Uh, and we have uh, two protocol, uh, protocol AG and uh, protocol AH. Uh, protocol AG is a randomized trial to assist the pneumatic vitrolysis in uh, vitromacular traction. Uh, and their aim is uh, to randomize the patient to observation uh, and sham injection or uh, the injection of uh, C3 uh, F8 gas in patients with VMT and assess the, the result at the end of two, 24 weeks. And we have protocol H, which is a similar study done for macular holes. But uh, both of the study showed uh, higher risk of retinal detachment initially in the study. And uh, they are on hold to assist the uh, risk and, um, uh, and there is a possibility that they will terminate both of those study. Uh, and we have protocol AE, which assists the photobiomodulation therapy for diabetic macular edema. So what is photobiomodulation? Uh, radiation by the light in the far red to near infrared region of the spectrum from 60, uh, 630 to 900, uh, a meter is collectively termed photobiomodulation. It has shown to be effective in the literature to, to improve wound healing, decreasing apoptosis, decreasing sedative stress, and decreasing leukocytosis, and expression of uh, ICAM, which is involved in the capillary permeability in diabetic animals. Uh, the potential effectiveness of the study is that photobiomodulation have low treatment burden, no known side effect, and possible high public uh, impact uh, if this non-invasive treatment is effective in diabetic macadema, plus the potential uh, uh, intervention and or prevention of, the, of diabetic complication. Uh, so uh, the device that was invented is called uh, Ritalex device, which is a photobiomodulation of thermic treatment device by uh, photo, uh, Photoptics. It's a head strap uh, and it uh, applied the treatment for 90 seconds and then shut off. Uh, and uh, th this trial will have two phases. The third phase, they will randomize the patient into an observation group uh, and a photobiomodulation group. And later in the study, they will switch. The aim of the switch is for the treatment, to receive the treatment initially to, to know how long the treatment effect lasts. And 
for the patients who are switched off, uh, switched to the photobiomodulation arm to know uh, if there is an effect after the switch. We have genetic uh, and diabetic retinopathy project uh, where they, they will assess uh, uh, previous and current participant in the DRCR uh, retina network, aiming to create a registry and database uh, in order to assess the genetic susceptibility and resistance to diabetic uh, retinopathy and also variant impacting visually important biomarker for myocardium and neovascularization. And the term, total enrollment in the study of uh, 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 in, in the genetic project in the DRCR network are 2,500 subjects as of uh, the 5th of February in 2021. And we have lastly protocol AF, which is a randomized trial evaluating phenofibrate for the prevention of diabetic retinopathy worsening. Uh, so phenofibrate is uh, an antidiabetic oral agent uh, that is effective at reducing uh, worsening of diabetic retinopathy uh, and might decrease the number of patients who develop vision threatening complications. Uh, it reduced visual loss from advanced diabetic retinopathy and also reduced the complication. And we still don't know any long-term study uh, to evaluate uh, phenofibrate. Uh, there were two uh, previous uh, uh, placebo-controlled clinical trial, FID and ACCORD. Uh, both of them demonstrated the beneficial effect of phenofibrate diabetic retinopathy, but yet it did not catch on uh, and was not adapted by retina specialists yet, either due to the confirmation or to the belief that the data were not strong or due to the hesitation of use of uh, uh, a systemic drug by ophthalmologists or to inabil uh, inability to successfully grade retinal disease uh, by uh, primary care physician. Uh, so the two studies I mentioned, they are the accord and field study. Uh, and both of them, when we look to the diabetic retinopathy progression rate, it was uh, lower in the, uh, in the phenofibrate group compared to the placebo. In a court study, it was five compared to 12. And in field study, it was three compared to 15. Uh, so the aim of this uh, study is, uh, it is a randomized multicenter control trial. Uh, one arm of the study will be receiving oral 160 milligram phenofibrate and the other arm be placebo, and the primary outcome is to see the proportion of patient of eyes that uh, develop diabetic retinopathy worsening by four years. We have uh, protocol AJ, which will study the vitreous proteometric in eyes with macular hole. Uh, so again, vitreous proteometric is uh, coming uh, studies uh, in various diseases, and the, uh, the DRCR network uh, are tackling the macular hole by studying the vitreous proteometric. And for the, for the sake of time, uh, I will skip that one. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, I'll go over what uh, uh, have been shown by each study in just brief. Uh, so in 2008, Protocol B showed us that focal and grid laser was more effective uh, than uh, intravitreal time slow in treating diabetic macular edema. In 2007, Protocol H was the first multicenter randomized control trial demonstrating the anti VGF benefit in the form of bifazizumab to in reduction of diabetic macular edema. In 2010, we have protocol I, in which uh, intravitreal ranibizumab with prompt or deferred laser was more effective than laser alone. Uh, at increasing visual acuity in eye with center involved uh, diabetic macular edema. Uh, in 2015, we have protocol T, uh, and it showed that in eyes uh, with diabetic macular edema and moderate or worse visual acuity, 2050 or worse at baseline, aplibercept uh, were superior in visual acuity results compared to bevacizumab, ranibizumab. Uh, keeping in mind that the ranimizumab that was used was uh, 0.3 milligram in that study, and that's similar to our practice of using 0.5. And that in eyes uh, with diabetic macroedema with initial visual acuity with uh, better than uh, 2050 vision, the result between those, all, uh, between those three agents were similar. In 2018, in protocol U, uh, it have shown that although 
its use is more likely to reduce the retinal thickness and increase intraocular pressure. The combination of dexamethasone and ranibizumab does not improve visual acuity at 24 uh, weeks compared to ranibizumab alone. So the difference was in reduction of retinal thickness, but not visual acuity. And in 2009, in protocol B, uh, that among eyes with center involving diabetic macular edema with good visual acuity, uh, 2025 or better, a visual acuity loss after two years were similar regardless of whether initial management was aflipercept uh, or laser or observation. And that each treatment strategy resulted in a mean vision of 2020. Uh, when you talk about the uh, diabetic retinopathy rather than macadema, we have protocol F in 2009 that showed that among eyes with uh, BDR treated with BRB, uh, clinically meaningful difference are likely in visual acuity or macadema following application of BRB in one setting compared to four setting. Protocol S in 2015, visual acuity at two years with ranibizumab is non inferior. Uh, uh, when compared to uh, BRP in cases of BDR. Uh, and later on in 2018, the continuation of five year protocol is the main change in visual acuity with ranibizumab was similar to BRP at five years. Uh, substantial visual acuity loss was rare for both group. Visual feed loss progressed in both group. Uh, vitreous hemorrhage uh, in almost 50% of both group. In 2020, protocol AB showed that, that in eyes with vitreous hemorrhage from BDR, there was no significant difference in mean visual acuity letter score over 24 weeks when comparing aflipercept versus uh, initial vitrectomy with BRP, and that vision improved more quickly in the vitrectomy group, but long-term vision was the same. And considering the range of confidence interval, a clinically important benefit in favor of initial vitrectomy with photocoagulation over 24 weeks cannot be excluded. And at the end, uh, I th uh, would like to thank you all for your attention. And I would like uh, to thank the DRCR network for the previous and their continuous advance in the field of diabetic retinopathy uh, and in the way that affect our management and how we treat our patient. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Abdurrahman, for this uh, nice uh, overview of the um, uh, important uh, article from the DRCR net, uh, network. Um, so uh, the floor is open now for any question or comment uh, regarding Dr. Zaid lecture. So. Uh, Is there any question? And you can so a question, and we can. Assalamu uh, uh, alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you, Dr. Abdurrahman, for this good lecture. Um, I have a question regarding. You mentioned um, uh, the use of antivirus. Uh, can, can you tell us PDR. your name? Uh, Abdulaziz Tessa. Abdulaziz. Yes, welcome. So you mentioned the use yes, of. Go ahead. Uh, anti-VEGF injections in the treatment, that it can be um, an initial uh, method of treatment for uh, PDR, especially if it is combined with diabetic macular edema. Um, and you said that it is difficult to apply, and I, and I agree, but my question is, if you choose to do um, or to use anti-VEGF injections in cases of PDR plus diabetic macular edema, and then you give one or two injections and you find that the edema is resistant. So would you consider adding PRP on this stage? Or you would consider it as, I mean, as, uh, as, as, as we all know that DME might not respond uh, from the first one or two injections. So will you keep, will you keep injecting or you will add PRP at this stage? Thank you. So I will uh, keep injecting, of course, and the uh, protocol T showed, that, showed us that 50% uh, uh, patients have uh, distant diabetic edema by the first year, and that uh, this number decreased by the end of the second year. 
uh, I do PRP for my patients when they have uh, uh, progressive diabetic retinopathy. But if I was going to apply protocol uh, S and inject a patient, and I found that the patient had a persistent diabetic macular edema, uh, this will let me re actually relax more and keep injecting them, knowing that uh, I'm doing, I'm treating both conditions the diabetic macadema and the BDR. That was your question. So if there is any uh, other question or uh, comment, I think we have uh, one minute remaining. Uh, in the chat here, all uh, they are uh, thanking you for the informative uh, uh, lecture. So there is no specific question. I, I think there is a question here. So from Rakan, amongst the studies of anti-VGF, is there anyone look for anti-VGF for pregnancy? Uh, uh, I believe there is a study uh, uh, that have addressed the risk, but not in the DRCR network not from the one I have mentioned, but I need to look back into those. The no doctor I remember one right now. Yeah, so basically this is a uh, Dr. Abdurrahman, he focused on the uh, DRCR uh, network uh, study. However, there is other studies uh, that he did not cover. And uh, even the DRCR network has, has a huge number of study. He did not cover all of them but he picked uh, some of the important uh, uh, article that they uh, publish, uh, you know, um, uh, of uh, great importance of the uh, DRCR uh, network uh, uh, articles and studies. They change the practice and the pattern of practice that we are doing uh, nowadays. I think we... Um, we're just on time. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdurrahman. Thank you Thank for you. our audience. And uh, hope to see you uh, in the future meeting. Thank you, Dr. Abdurrahman. Thank you very much.